You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Charlie Tremendous Jones and says, you will be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. You will be the same person in five years as you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. That's one of my all time favorite quotes and encapsulates the attributes that lead to enormous personal growth. And that's exactly what we're gonna get into today with our special guest. For more than 30 years, Jeff Brown has earned his living behind a microphone, first as an award-winning broadcaster and more recently as an award-nominated podcaster, consultant, and speaker. In 2013, he launched the top-rated Read to Lead podcast, featuring interviews with today's most renowned authors, including Simon Sinek, Gary Vaynerchuk, Stephen Covey, Nancy Duarte, and since then, more than 300 more. Jeff has leveraged his experience as a former on-air personality to not only forge a successful path for his own podcast, but also coach and mentor numerous other award-winning podcasters as well. In addition, he's worked with several multi-million dollar businesses on the launch of their podcasts and even consulted to the US government. Jeff and his work have been featured in Inc., Entrepreneur, and HubSpot, as well as in the blogs of Seth Godin, Chris Brogan, and Social Media Explorer. In this interview, we're gonna cover a ton of stuff. We're gonna talk about the number one habit to boost your intelligence, how to connect with the world's most influential people, the biggest mistakes amateur podcasters make, how to speed read so you can get through and absorb a full book in less than 60 minutes, and the simple success blueprint Jeff created from interviews with more than 300 of the world's most accomplished people. Before we get started, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Jeff Brown. Jeff, it is great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win The Day Show. Well, I am excited to be here, James. I am really thrilled that uh, you thought well enough of me to invite me on. So thanks. <laughs> well, we have a, we have so much to discuss. I want to get into your mm. awesome new book, Read to Lead. I want to talk about your podcasting career, how you've been able to connect mm. with so many amazing high-level people and maintain those relationships. So to kick mm. things off, why don't you, you take us right back to, to when you were young? And uh, is there a vivid memory or, or story that comes to mind that helps illustrate what your childhood was like? Yeah, I think probably the one that comes to mind first is uh, after one Christmas, so one of the best Christmases I remember as a child, uh, and included a, a, a stereo system. And I'm old enough uh, for that stereo system to have included a record player, an eight track player, and an analog radio all built into one. <laughs> and I can remember sitting at that thing and having music coming from each one of the three sources. Uh, you know, a song from here and then back announcing the song like a radio host does and then introducing the next one and then that one finishing and, you know, prepping the next and all that kind of just playing DJ in my room as a kid. And then later on, I would I would grow up and spend, you know, 26 years in radio and then now, you know, eight years as a, as a podcast host interviewing uh, authors. Uh, so it's, it was that was an early sign that I was I was going to do something with that. Yeah, the origins of your the origins of your podcasting and, and broadcasting career. Well, when when you were young, like it's when I was young, the, the books that really stand out to me are things like Choose Your Own Adventure books, and then I graduated to some John Grisham books, which are still mm. so vivid for me. What were the books that you read when when you were young that that you naturally gravitated towards? I love mysteries. Uh, my mom uh, kept me in uh, heap supply of of the Hardy Boys uh, books when I was a kid. Uh, I remember reading books like Encyclopedia Brown, which I thought was cool because his last name was Brown. And <laughs> they were great. Uh, they were definitely on my list too. <laughs> and then you know I kind of graduated in middle school to things like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And um, and then in my early twenties, I began to get introduced to to nonfiction books. And and unfortunately, at that time. Um, I, I didn't quite take to them uh, books from folks like Zig Ziglar and Og Mandino. I was toying with the idea of going into radio sales because that's where the real money was at in radio, I was told. And, and that's not necessarily untrue. Uh, but I didn't really take uh, to those books from Zig and from Og. I think uh, I just was immature, frankly. I just wasn't ready for them. Uh, and it wasn't until about 10 or so years after that in my early 30s where I got introduced to 
Jim Collins and Seth Godin and Pat Lencioni that I went, oh, wow, um, uh, here, here, are some, here are some people that can mentor me who I've never met, but through their books can mentor me. And so that was an epiphany for me at that time. And, and my reading habit started there and it's, it's only grown. Yeah with, those, yeah, with those personal development books, it's very much a case, isn't it, that when the student is ready, the master, the master will appear. I mean, there's so many mentors that we can get from, from the written word, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I kind of, I was talking to a, a professor at Wharton, uh, the Wharton School of Business uh, a couple of weeks ago. His name is Richard Schell. And I asked him about his thoughts on, you know, reading and, and intentional, consistent reading and just how that's played a role in his professional life. And he said, I kind of view it as uh, having coffee with the author. And so I asked myself, who do I want to have coffee with? And then I pick and choose my mentors and the books I'm going to read based on the answer to that question. Yeah, so good. Well, what was the moment in your life when you recognized for the first time that you had more power that you had ever given yourself credit for, that you realized mm -hmm. that you could do absolutely anything that you set your mind to? Later in life than I would have liked, <laughs> but it was probably in my late 30s, um, about five or eight years into this sort of reading journey, the books that I was reading, books on mindset and books on finding the work you love and your passion, those kinds of things, led me to begin believing that you know, I could earn a living based on what was coming out of my own brain and not just necessarily working for someone else. There's nothing wrong with doing that. And I did that for you know, a number of years. Uh, but uh, reading the books I was reading and growing uh, per uh, personally and professionally through those books really helped open my eyes, James, to what the possibilities really were. And so when the opportunity was presented to me, and by opportunity presented to me, I mean losing my job, <laughs> when the last time that happened... Uh, I thought, well, maybe maybe this is the shove. This is the push I need to kind of start doing my own thing. That was eight years ago last month, and I haven't looked back since and have uh, continued to to figure out one way or another how to earn a living uh, through what comes out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So that, was, that must have been 2013, the year that you actually started the Read to Lead podcast. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, I had already begun planning the podcast, uh, coincidentally. It would launch almost a month to the day after I got downsized from that last job. Uh, and so the first six or eight months uh, earning an income, I mean, I had severance and, and, and uh, you know, things like that, that to sort of bridge the gap. But um, in those first six or eight months, I, I was kind of you know, working a side hustle that I, had, that I had done for a while part time and started doing that full time. And it wasn't long before I began making more money in that side hustle. In fact, the first 30 days, I made twice as much in that side hustle as I was making in the job I had just lost. And so I thought, well, I can do this. I can, I can make this work. I don't want to do this side hustle long term, but at least I know I can keep my head above water until I kind of figure things out. And it took me about eight or so months to, to do that. But once, once I got to that point, I began uh, you know, selling uh, my own courses and programs and that sort of thing and kind of figuring out what are the different income streams I want to uh, uh, include. Um, and the cool thing about that, as you no doubt know, is you know, now I've got, uh, I've had anywhere at any one time, 10 or 12 different income streams and some of them come and go, some of them are seasonal. Uh, but the cool thing is, is, you know, if one drops off the map, I've still got the other nine or whatever the number is. And so, and, and I control them to a degree. I can decide when I want to do certain ones or when I need to do certain ones. Uh, and that's a far better for me position to be in than being beholden to a single source of income from a single employer who could decide tomorrow I'm no longer needed. Mm. And I, what I love about there is that the universe gave you a nudge and that's what happens sometimes. But other people, many people, maybe even most people don't recognize it and they enter that, um, that woe is me mindset and, and they don't have that resourcefulness and resilience to, to create that life that they want. Was it a process for you? It sounds like what you were doing was, was very intentional and obviously yielded some great benefits. What was that process of you accepting that nudge from the universe to harness that energy that you needed to, to build the life and business that you wanted? Yeah, it started with uh, just having a desire to do my own thing several years before all this took place, the story we just talked about. And so I wanted to sort of dabble and play with my own business. And so I started a side business building mobile apps and websites for small, lo mostly local businesses, particularly those who wanted to dabble in the, the um, uh, app space, but didn't think that was something they could necessarily afford as a way to more uh, directly and intimately connect with their customers. 
And so I just sort of taught myself these things online and taking courses and that sort of thing, reading books. And again, did that part time. And in early 2013, the person who had hired me at this company I was working for all those years ago left. And I'd been in a situation before where the person had, who hired me had left, and that usually didn't end well. And so I began thinking, uh, well, maybe now's the, now's the time to go out on my own. And I talked with my wife about it. And again, in early 2013, we talked about setting a deadline of December 31st. And I think one of the reasons I set the deadline so far away well, that made sense in some ways, but it was far enough away that it, it seemed like, okay, that's something I don't have to deal with right now. I can put that off until later. Uh, so this is like in March or April of that year, December 31st, December 31st. But in, in, in June, the hammer came down and suddenly my timetable you know, got moved up by about six months. And that's when I thought, well, that side hustle that I've been doing for three years, now it's time for that thing to, to you know, play the role I need it uh, to play. And so, um, uh, you know, as I said before, it, 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 it helped me out for those first uh, six or eight months. But during that whole time, I was, I was thinking about, well, what can I create? Uh, what can I build? What can I, and I had desire to coach, to, uh, to uh, write, uh, to train, to speak. Uh, and, and many other things. And so those are all things that one at a time over the first five or six years of my self-employment journey, I would build. I don't recommend trying to do them all at once, but as I was able, I would dabble in another stream of income and see how that went. And some of those streams of income I've done multiple times, but primarily now it's speaking, coaching, writing, and consulting for the most part. Yeah. That the ability to teach and to sell. I feel like it is such mm. critical aspects of, of for pretty much anyone on earth who wants to have their own, uh, who wants to be a leader, as you talk about in your book, or who wants to grow their, their own business. And all of that, of course, comes back to um, the power of books and everything that you can learn from mm. there. Uh, you are a voracious reader. And in Read to Lead, you mentioned books like Good to Great from Jim Collins and Purple Cow from Seth Godin. Uh, were they the two, one or two books that contribute the most to the mindset that you have today? They certainly were the, the catalyst for reigniting my love for reading. I can say that for sure, especially Seth's uh, Purple Cow. That uh, was the first of those uh, businessy books I began reading in my early 30s. And it just opened up, uh, my eyes to what was out there. I, embarrassingly, I, you know, I didn't read at all for the you know, better part of my 20s and on into my early 30s. And I just had never really jumped in fully to uh, personal and professional development type books, nonfiction books. And so when these books were presented to me, uh, you know, as you said before, when the student is ready, the master will, will come. And it was just all the stars and planets aligned. And I was like, gosh, this stuff has been out there all this time. And I've not been taking advantage of this. And as I began diving into these books and you know, choosing books based on where I was in my career versus where I wanted to be, skills I wanted to cultivate that I knew would help me in my career and then eventually my business, like public speaking and that sort of thing. I began devouring books like that. And as I did, I realized, James, that just by nature of doing those things, I, were, I was doing something, practicing something consistently that most of my colleagues did not. And just by that habit alone, reading on a regular basis separated me from most of my, my peers and got me noticed. And the things that I began to implement and try in my job, the things that didn't work, that failed, nobody remembered. Nobody thought much about, but the things that did take, that did, that did work, people noticed. And that presented to me new opportunities, new experiences, chances to do things other people weren't getting the chance uh, to do. And I attribute that sort of upward trajectory in the last seven or eight years I was with that company. Um, and then on into today um, as, as uh, all to reading, all to the, the consistent and intentional reading I do is, is singularly responsible for a large part of, of, of my success. Pound for pound, I think you've got some of the best quotes ever included in your in your book. The one that just came <laughs> to mind based on all the things you had just mentioned there is, mm. uh, I forget, is it possibly Martin Luther King Jr. from your book who mentioned that it's not a lack of resources, it's a lack of will. That, that one quote for me in particular, because uh, it comes back to this, is human motivation and what we can do to create sustainable change. And mm. there's a statistic that you share in your book that the number of adults who have not read any books in the past year has increased from 19% to 27%, which is like, I thought it was bad. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> 
If, if that trend continues of people not reading, how, how will that impact society? Oh, I, I shudder to think how that would impact society. I think we would have a, a lot of people who uh, are just consuming, uh, uh, you know, entertainment. And that's what, I, again, that's what I did for the better part of my 20s and, and early 30s is I was a consumer strictly of things that entertain, movies and music and those. And, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But I, I shudder to think how society would be impacted if we're not willing or desire to take advantage of the knowledge that is out there. The thing that's special, James, about books, as you know, is it's all in one place. It's not like a blog post that takes 10 minutes to write or what have you. It's not like a, a YouTube video that might take a, a half hour to create. It's not like this interview that will you know, be complete uh, for all intents and purposes in a half hour to 45 minutes. A book uh, from an author takes years certainly takes months, if not years. And it's, it's all of these thoughts and wisdom in one place. It's gone through, uh, in the case of a traditionally published book like mine, it's been vetted by dozens and dozens of people. And to have all that knowledge in one place and not to take advantage of it, to me, is just, it's just silly. <laughs> it's just crazy not to want to do that. And then with a book, you know, I can get value from it and then I can turn around, I can hand it to you and you can get the same experience. And so, um, you know, that number has grown, as, as you said, I'd like to think uh, through efforts like people like myself and this book and my podcast, we can help ebb the increase <laughs> that we're seeing in, in that area. I, I love all the work you're doing, Jeff. There was another story mentioned from your book about someone, I think it was one of the guest experts you had in for their little breakouts talking about how the power of reading has helped impacted their career. I think that was a fantastic conclusion mm. too, about someone who picked up a copy of Think and Grow Rich for, uh, for $4 and then to quantify mm. the ROI that that book alone has had on that person's life. And there's a statistic that I share at many of the speeches that I do, uh, and that's that more than five times the amount of money that is spent on books is spent on lottery tickets by people in the wow. US, and which is crazy because it, it says to me that people are spending all their time, energy, and money on lottery tickets for that one in 300 million chance of hitting the jackpot. But literally every single book I've read, every single one of them has changed my life mm. in some capacity. So how do, we, how do we get people interested and excited in, in reading again, especially that the benefits are, are pretty clear about how powerful they are? Yeah, I like what um, uh, John Maxwell says about this. He wasn't talking about books uh, specifically, but he was talking about um, in reference to anything that is, uh, uh, requires a sacrifice. Uh, typically, when it comes to the sacrifice that comes with um, self-discipline and personal growth, we don't want to experience the pain that's associated with that. And so we put those tasks off like reading. But what follows when we do that is another kind of pain, and that's the pain of regret. And I'd much rather experience the pain that comes with sacrifice and growth today so that tomorrow I don't have to experience the pain of regret. And so that's my advice to people to realize that there's pain either way. You can have pain today or you can have pain or you're going to have pain. <laughs> you're not going to you're not going to experience growth without some sacrifice. But boy, uh, on the other side of that, you know, weeks from now, months from now, years from now, not having that pain of regret is an incredible feeling. And, and, and if that's not motivation to buckle down and do some reading, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah, very true, my friend, very true. Well, what's, what's the best way to consume and absorb? There's actually a Napoleon Hill quote that I, that I love. It says, it doesn't matter what you know, it matters what you do with what you know. It's one that I share in all the different coaching groups and things that I have constantly um, because the big challenge that I see for a lot of people, they want like a piece of paper to be able to say, yes, now my life is a success, whether it's a college degree or anything like that. But it doesn't matter what you know, it matters what you do with what you know. Mm. So what's the best way to consume and, and really absorb books if our goal is to continue to learn, increasingly become a person of value, and then apply what we have learned in our, our life and business? Yeah, a couple of things I would say there is, is maybe change how you take notes. Most of us take notes as we go, as we read, as I uh, once did. And I've found over time, excuse me, that, that greatly slows down the process to the point where it could take several weeks to get through a 200-page book. And, 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 and really sort of get uh, disheartened with the process. Instead, as I read, I make simple notes or marks as I go along, you know, an asterisk for, for something important I want to remember or a cue for, say, a quote that resonated or a question mark for something maybe I don't understand or I'm not even sure I agree with. 
And then only after I've finished a chapter do I then synthesize what I've read by taking handwritten notes. Um, I like to use a paper tablet called the Remarkable. That's a new toy that I've acquired recently that I love. So it's replaced all the paper in my life. Another thing you might consider is combining two mediums. I first did this a couple of years ago and loved it uh, with uh, Brendan Burchard's book, uh, High Performance Habits. That was the first book I tried that with. And what I mean is I had the, the physical copy of the book and I followed along as Brendan read to me the audio version of the book. And I sped it up to one and a half or 1.75 or two times speed. And having those two mediums, consuming those two mediums simultaneously really helped ingrain the book's uh, concepts into my, into my brain. And another thing I would say, the last thing I would say is consider combining one of those two things I just mentioned with uh, teaching the material, whether that's you know, to one person, like a coworker or in a meeting with staff, maybe as part of a formal book club or even like a, a lunch and learn to members of you know, your local chamber of commerce or any other local or online group. That sort of pre preparing to teach the material forces you to really uh, synthesize it down into easy to explain, easy to understand uh, concepts and, and, and share it in your own words. And once you get to that point and being able to share a book and, and concepts and things you've learned in that way, you'll, you'll have truly retain them and be ready to, to put them into action. Yeah. Really great practical stuff there, Jeff. I love it. That's what I love so much about the book too. And mm -hmm. a question, what I, what I wanted to ask you is what's the best way to figure out what you should and shouldn't read. And for anyone who's trying to figure out what list of books they should read, you should grab a copy of read to lead because there are a ton of books mentioned in there because a lot of people say, well, what am I, what am I actually going to read? So how do people figure out what the best book is for them, assuming they want to get from point A to, to point B specifically in their lives? Yeah, I heard James Clear uh, once say, James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, I think this was on Twitter, as a matter of fact, he said, you know, um, uh, find a book on something that you want to learn more about. Um, read books about things you want to learn more about, and you will never be bored. A lot of people talk about reading books and being bored by them. I have never found that to be the case, as long as the thing I'm reading is something I truly want to learn about. So in my career, I mentioned you know, public speaking. Um, I was terrified of public speaking back in the day, but I knew that in my career, both um, in, in where I was wanting to go with my career in radio, and then now as a self-employed person, that being able to be an effective public speaker was going to be key. And so I have devoured books that helped me learn how to uh, craft a talk, how to deliver a talk, uh, books on how to create um, a compelling slides, how to get booked and paid to speak. All different kinds of books exist on that single topic. And so over the years, I have read books related to public speaking on all those different topics, get really a uh, well-rounded uh, view and experience as to how to do this, how to do it well, and how to be successful with it. And so, uh, you know, decide in your career today, whether that's the topic of marketing, or maybe that's sales, maybe that's public speaking, whatever that might be, and know that there are a plethora of solid books uh, from all different angles, like the public speaking example I gave on that topic. Decide where you want to begin, where it makes sense to begin and start with those books. So in the case of public speaking, though, if I had to do, to do over again, I'd probably do this differently. I started with presentation design, slide design, books from Gar Reynolds and books from Nancy uh, Duarte, like uh, Slideology, for example. Because uh, I found that when I got up in front of an audience, nervous though I was, I was less so when I was confident in my slides and when I admittedly felt like my slides could take center stage and I could take a back seat. That helped with my nerves. And I wouldn't recommend that now. You know, you should be the focal point. Your slides should support you. But that helped give me the confidence to get in front of audiences while I was working on, on my craft. Uh, so, so that's just one example, but I would decide on where you want to begin and then work your way into those books. And then what's the next step that you want to learn about the process and go from there. You mentioned finding something that you love is a great way to make that uh, for people to develop an interest in books. Is that how you'd get young people interested in books? I think there are a lot of parents out there, myself included, who are wondering what can we do to create that lifelong love of learning, which of course comes from ideally reading rather than something like a, a tablet put in front of them. How do, how do we get young people excited in reading at such a young age? Yeah, well, my mother was an, a great example of this. My sister uh, was a great example of this. Uh, I remember you know, multiple uh, trips to the library as a kid uh, uh, with, uh, in her case, multiple kids in tow. And, you know, in my um, uh, 
uh, acknowledgments of, of, of the read to lead. I, I tell that story about how much I appreciated that from my mom because it really instilled in me a, a love for reading that though school later educated it out of me, if I'm being honest, no offense uh, to teachers in, in school, I was always having to read things I wasn't interested in. And that's a big problem that really, uh, you know, for kids like me who loved reading to go through school and then have it sort of educated, the desire educated out of you, that's kind of sad. And so we need to find a way to afford kids the opportunity to be able to read things uh, that excite them, not just in school, obviously, but uh, at home and get them uh, away from screens and mobile devices. My sister, I mentioned, was excellent at this as a mom. Her kids are teenagers now. But, you know, when it came to electronic devices, you know, there were timers set and you had so much time on that device. Um, you know, uh, spending time reading was something that was far more valued than these other uh, devices. Now they have a little bit more access to those devices now that they're in their late uh, teens and control that a little more than they did when they were young. Uh, but I remember sending my, my uh, nephew, who was 13 years old at the time, a copy of How to Win Friends and, and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And he devoured it in two days. And, and that's because my sister did such, and she's a teacher herself, did such a great job of instilling that desire in them while they were young. So you know, maybe it's mysteries. Maybe it's not necessarily, you know, how-to books or, or, or nonfiction for your kids. It can be Encyclopedia Brown or, or Lord of the Rings or whatever. But find what they're interested in, what they're fascinated in, and make sure you are affording them an opportunity uh, to read those things. And even uh, do go so far as to, uh, my, my, I've done this, <clears throat> my sister does this as well, uh, incentivizing that with allowance money or, or, or um, you know, surprise trips or, um, you know, in exchange for a book report, uh, having read something, something along those lines. I, I have a friend of mine who started a website called the Better Book Club that uh, encourages businesses to encourage their employees to read and not necessarily everybody reading the same thing at the same time as we typically think of, of book clubs to be but just in encouraging employees to, to read uh, about the things they want to learn about in general, and then being able to catalog that, to track that, and then reward them for having done so. Yeah, it's like nurturing that creativity rather than trying to force them with the hammer to, right. to try and absorb something that they, they don't want to be a part of at all. How, how can someone increase their reading speed? Maybe there are people out there who are, who are super time poor or people who just want to be able to get through more content regularly. Mm -hmm. How can people increase their, their reading speed? And, and what does the science tell us about how effective speed reading is? Well, a lot of folks sort of poo-poo speed reading. I have not perfected this yet, I have to admit. My, my co-author, Jesse uh, Wisniewski, is the expert here. But one of the things that he teaches that, that I have gotten a lot of value from is the act or the art of skimming. And so I did that just in the last two days. I interviewed an author uh, who I won't mention because I don't want her to know I only skimmed her book. <laughs> <laughs> I just interviewed her this morning. But I was able to interview her uh, and, and leave the impression, uh, not that I'm trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes, you understand, but she had um, all the confidence in the world that I had spent plenty of time with her book. And I did spend you know, a couple of hours with it, but that was by uh, skimming the headings and subtitles, reading the first sentence of a paragraph and the last sentence of a paragraph. That's where in, in, in nonfiction books, you'll usually find the key concepts and main ideas. And going through each chapter one at a time, doing that and taking notes as I end each chapter. Again, just skimming the chapters, reading the headings, the subheadings, and the first and last sentence of each paragraph. Of course, the introduction and the conclusion, if there, if there is one, as part of that process as well. Now, that can take, you know, 30 minutes or so, but in that amount of time, you can get, easily get the key insights and main ideas from a book. And in my case, that fully prepared me to have a um, engaging conversation with that author about that book. And at no time did I feel like I didn't have a grasp of the concepts that she wanted to get across. I didn't feel like I was somehow you know, behind the eight ball, if you will, only having done that exercise. I felt just in a lot of ways, and again, this works for nonfiction only, but in a lot of ways, I felt just as prepared as I do when I read a book from cover to cover and sit down and interview somebody. So if, if you're pressed for time, uh, and, and when it comes to nonfiction, that's one great way uh, to, to get the key insights and main ideas. You mentioned intent about approaching books in, in Read to Lead, which I think is very powerful and something that I just, I really haven't heard before specifically for 
reading. Everyone hears about the power of intent, but saying, what is, what is my intention? What outcome do I want to have as a result of consuming this particular book and reading towards getting that? And I think that is such a, a really important thing. Can you expand on that for people who, who are unfamiliar with a, a reading plan or having approaching uh, reading with any type of intent before? Mm. Yeah, it was Stephen R. Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People who said, begin with the end in mind. That's habit number two, right? And so I do this with a lot of things. When I sit down to interview an author uh, and before I jump into their book, I decide, what do I want my audience, my listeners to get out of the book? Well, that's the key insights and main ideas. So, so once I've answered that question, I know what I'm looking for in the book and I know um, when I find it, then what questions I can ask that lead to those answers, uh, those responses. And even when I'm reading a book just, you know, for personal enjoyment, that's where I'll begin. What do I want to get out of this book? What's my goal with this book? To actually write those things down on paper or on, in my case, my remarkable tablet that I'm in love with. Uh, so you write these things down, make a list. And then as you read, check those things off as you achieve each one of those objectives. Now, you may find, and this has happened to me in a lot of cases, uh, in nonfiction, you can do this, of course. You might be jumping around from chapter to chapter rather than reading the book from start to, uh, to finish based on those objectives. So you can, quote unquote, finish a book sooner than you might have thought you could finish because you realize, well, I don't have to read or I don't need to read every single chapter to reach the goal I wanted to reach in the first place. So that's another way, going back to what we were talking about earlier, to read books more quickly. You may not need to read the whole book, or you may read the first couple of chapters and realize this is not doing it for me. <laughs> Don't feel <laughs> obligated to finish a book if it's not working for you. Don't be afraid to set it aside. I would say is just sort of a tip to keep the habit going. You didn't ask about this specifically, but um, always have your next book in the queue. Uh, especially in moments like that where you get a little bit into a book and you realize, eh, I'm done or, or I got through this faster than I thought I was going to or this isn't doing it for me or whatever. If you don't have that next book in the queue and, and, and you're not ready to just jump right in, you might spend several days or weeks or months going, oh, I'll, I'll figure out what that next book is going to be eventually. Mm -hmm. Have that next book in the queue. So if you get the one you're reading done sooner than you thought, you're not having to think about, okay, what do I read next? It's already in your mind and ready to jump into Finding, maintaining, and applying that passion seems like the, the winning formula here, Jeff. Uh, I totally <laughs> love that. Uh, I'd like to switch gears now and, and focus on the relationship side specifically. You've been able to connect with a ton of high-level people, Gary Vaynerchuk, Nancy Duarte, who you mentioned before, Simon Sinek, Stephen Covey, Seth Godin, uh, a whole bunch of really influential people. What's the formula for connecting with people who are so influential in their respective industries? Um, wait till they have something they want to promote. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> That's one way. It's true. Well, yeah. yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, you know, to, to that, uh, I'll, uh, just being completely transparent here, you know, I asked Seth Godin to be on my show, I think, three times before he said yes. Uh, and, and so that's, there's a lesson here. When someone tells you no, unless the answer is no and don't ever contact me again, uh, assume that no is a not right now. And, and I've taken that to heart. And so when Seth said no the first time, you know, uh, three or four months later, I tried again, got a second no. And then 15 months after that, I asked the third time and got a yes. Now, the fourth time I asked him to be on my show, he said no. The fifth time, he said yes. So he's come on twice out of five asks, right? Uh, so I don't think any less of Seth because sometimes he says no, but I also recognize that those no's aren't no forever. They're not right now in most uh, cases. And, and in, through those yeses, um, you know, I try to go out of my way to when I sit down with someone who's given me 30 or 40 minutes of their time to make sure I'm super prepared. I put a lot of prep and practice into coming into that conversation so that they, they know I'm taking this seriously. You know, I, I send them questions in advance oftentimes, and that's not so much for uh, them to, to be better prepared, though that's part of it. More than anything else, though they don't know this, and the cat's out of the bag now, it's to say, okay, look, I, I've done my homework here. You know, I've, I've gone through this book, and I've decided in advance what I'm going to ask you. And, and that says a lot. I find that that speaks to people. I have a lot of authors tell me, you know, it's nice to have s sat down with somebody who's actually read the book. Even if that, for me, was, was skimming the highlights of the book through that technique I talked about earlier, I'll have them say that. Wow, it's really nice uh, to sit down with somebody who's actually read the book for a change. You know, so they're, they're not used to that. And so with authors specifically, uh, that, can go, that can go a long, long way. 
Yeah, Jeff, what you said there, I mean, the amount of podcasters out there that are just so lazy, so lazy <laughs> to do that, to do that work. Like I've had people, exa those exact same comments. And I think yeah. as both a host and a guest, there needs to be some level of urgency. You don't want to get someone on your show to talk about business as usual. And you and I, we both get featured on a ton of other podcasts. We don't want to come on and talk about business as usual. Having mm. something like a product that's coming out or a mission that we have, something new that we are creating or releasing to go and help change the lives of a bunch of people is, is what creates that urgency. What about maintaining that relationship? What do you do to stay front of mind and, and continue to add value to those people on an ongoing basis? I try to pay attention uh, to little cues and I'll use Seth as an example. Again, um, the most recent time I asked him to be on my show, um, you know, he, uh, the yes I got, and, and I'm not throwing him under the bus here or not intending to, but the yes I got was sort of a reluctant yes. And he was doing a lot of interviews and his voice was begin was beginning to become hoarse. Well, I took that cue and I, I researched it and I sent him some lozenges in the mail to help him out. And, and the first time I interviewed him, I had somebody tell me who had worked with him, he loves jazz. Now, don't everybody take my secrets here with Seth. Um, and so I bought him like a Miles Davis CD compilation and just said, hey, thank you. Not, not, hey, will you do this interview? Here's, here's, some, here's a gift for, you know, it was after the interview was over. It was after he said yes. I said, hey, I really appreciate that. Here's, here's a token of my appreciation. He was over the moon about those things, really appreciated those things. So... You know, I think that he remembers that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just contemplating here. But when I say, hey, um, you know, I know this is a big ask, but would you consider uh, if, if you feel good about it, endorsing my book? He says, I'm super swamped, Jeff, but for you, I'll take a look, no promises. And then later that afternoon, uh, you know, Seth writes me back and said, hey, great job. Here's what I think about it. And also, because he's Seth, here's a couple of things you didn't address that I think you should address. And I was able to go back and, and address those and then send him an email and say, hey, Seth, here's how uh, we've chosen Jesse and I to address that. We just wanted to let you know that we've taken your advice and, 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 you know, and, and put it to use. And, and so you know, when it comes to, to mentors, especially people like Seth or whoever, when they give you advice, take the advice and then demonstrate and show them where you've taken that advice. Right? They, they love to see that. For everyone who's listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube, relationships are the key to absolutely everything. Mm. What Jeff has just shared there is the foundation of being able to approach and maintain relationships with the most influential people on the planet. And I know that works, Jeff, because that's exactly what I've been doing too. And people mm. are lazy about preparation. They're lazy about ongoing things. They're so busy focusing on a transaction about what I can get rather than, than what I can give. It, it really doesn't take much more, does it, to be able to provide that amazing experience? Because I think if the goal is transformation, we should be thinking about transformation for all stakeholders. You and I are having a conversation right now. We're talking about or thinking about what's the transformation that we want to create for the listener. We're thinking about, well, I know you're consciously too, you're thinking about what's the value that I want to provide to James as the host. And I'm thinking about what transformation can I provide to Jeff as a guest as far as being prepared and, and doing all of those those different things. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. And one thing I do want to point out, I think I made this obvious, but I want to make sure it's not lost on anybody. Um, you know, I've had people approach me, and this happened as recently, James, as this morning. Someone emailing me uh, who is pitching the show, and they're showing me in the email, here's the wonderful review I just left for you. Now have me on the show. I hate that. I despise that. So in my uh, interactions with Seth, you know, when I decided to do something nice, that was after the yes had already been given. It wasn't in an attempt to get a yes. I didn't try to bribe anybody or any of the relationships that I have. Once someone gives me a yes and gives their time, I want to go out of my way to thank them. And I try to find nice, unique ways to do that. But when you use it in that other way, to me, it's really smarmy and icky. <laughs> yeah, couldn't agree more. You know, I saw, I think it was uh, Keith Ferrazzi who posted on his Instagram stories a little while ago. Keith Ferrazzi, number one New York Times bestselling author of books like Never Eat Alone. And he had sent a photo that someone had posted him of one shoe. And that said, I wanted a foot in the door. When we meet in person, I will give you the other one. So not only was he able to have a creative way of approaching Keith, he was also mm. got, and to secure that interview, he was able to get Keith to share it with his audience on social huh. media. So there's a bunch of creative and uh, imaginative ways that you can get out there. You've just got to, you just got to think about them. Yeah. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so 
You've interviewed hundreds of people now on success, peak performance, leadership, confidence, all of these different things. Mm. When it comes to success out of all of these people that you've interviewed, what do the top 1% do differently? Are there any common traits that you've been able to identify? Yeah, and it's it's funny uh, with authors in particular, it's more than the top 1%. It's not all of them, uh, but authors tend to be successful people. They're, they've been blessed with the chance to write a book because they've oftentimes been successful elsewhere. And James, I've found there are five uh, things, um, and I've put them into an acronym called DREAM, D-R-E-A-M. And number one is successful people understand uh, what it means to dance with discomfort. They lean into discomfort. They ride the wave of discomfort. I, I said earlier, you know, I used to be terrified of public speaking. That was uncomfortable for me, but I knew I needed to develop that skill, so I leaned into it. I put myself out there. And, and the cool thing about that is when you lean into discomfort and you do things that scare you, the more you do them, the less uncomfortable and scary they, they become. I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who said, you know, do one thing every day uh, that scares That's you. Good. The second thing, and we've talked about this, um, uh, uh, for, uh, for a while now, and that's to re-engage with reading. No more needs to be said there. Successful people read. Number three is examine your energy. I color code my calendar based on what gives me energy, what takes away energy, and what neither gives or takes energy. And when I do that, I suddenly see, and if you do this, you'll suddenly see, well, gosh, if I've got a lot of red things back to back to back, you know, uh, I color things uh, that take energy red. I color things that give me energy green. Uh, then you, you recognize you need to do something. You need to change something. Maybe you need to delegate something. Maybe you need to bring some red or orange, those things that you're indifferent about, to the red. Um, the A is assemble your advisors. And I know you appreciate this. I think all successful people have a board, a personal board of advisors. For me, that's a mastermind group. I know that's special to you. Uh, of People I get together with every single Tuesday at 8.30 every morning uh, on Zoom. And we talk about what's going on in our businesses, how we can encourage each other and how we can challenge one another. And that group has pushed me to do so many things I would not have otherwise done. And the M is, is master your mornings. For me, mornings used to be, uh, I'd get up uh, about an hour before I had to walk out the door enough time to shower and get dressed and, and get something in my stomach and, and leave. But now uh, my mornings, a good three hours, some mornings or three and a half hours are spent in self-care where I've got anywhere from 12 or 13 different things, depending on how much time I have, whether that's three hours or two hours or what have you, to work on Jeff so that when I'm ready to, to get the day rolling and be productive, I've filled my own tank, right? And so uh, dance with discomfort, re-engage with reading, examine your energy, assemble your advisors and master your mornings. And I find that the most successful people I know and that I've interviewed do those five things. I think that is a perfect summary for, for personal growth. Uh, it's really, really great. Uh, you've spent more than three decades behind the mic as an award-winning broadcaster and podcast. You've helped launch a ton of other award-winning podcasters mm -hmm. in the US and around the world. What are the biggest mistakes you see amateur podcasters make that prevents them from getting to that next level? Uh, yeah, gosh, where do I start? No. <laughs> <laughs> a whole separate uh, episode we'll record for that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a number of directions I could take that. Um, but when it comes to interview based podcasts specifically, I find that many young podcasters or new podcasters, um, sort of build their marketing plan on thinking that, uh, the people that they interview are going to generously share the interview once it's over. That's not a marketing strategy. And so you've got to have some other, uh, other strategies at the ready. We don't have time to talk about those today necessarily, but uh, that's certainly something that now will, will some do it uh, and some do it generously. Absolutely. You know what happens when you come prepared, when you do a good job, when you make your guest look good by helping them be prepared. Oftentimes what you'll find is they'll share that transaction uh, because they felt good about it. They walk away having felt good about their own performance and they'll share about it without you even having to ask them to share it uh, for you. Uh, but don't come with that expectation. If a guest says, hey, I'm going to share this, let me know once, it, once it's live, how I can do that, thank them. Don't assume that that's something they're going to do. When they say that, take the posture of, wow, I never assumed that. Thank you so much for offering to do that. Yes, I'll make sure you have everything you need once the time comes so that you, so that you can do that. And, and another thing related to that is, is when you reach out to someone um, and ask for their time and they say yes, 
don't follow that with sending them a link to book the interview for you and ask yet another. They've already done one favor by saying yes. Go back to them and say, hey, how, uh, what's a good time, a good week, a good day? Um, if you have a link, a, a scheduling link, send that to me. Um, if it's just as easy to use mine, here it is. But don't make that the only option. They've already done one favor by saying yes. Don't immediately ask for another. Yeah, super practical stuff there. What about getting content out on a consistent basis? I know you've had hundreds of podcast episodes that you've produced just as a host. How do you get content out on such a regular basis? Is there anything that you do to streamline it from a process perspective or anything like that? Well, it start, yes, it starts with um, how I approach my calendar. And I build something, and I learned this from my mentor, Michael Hyatt, something called an ideal week. And so much like we would with a budget where we spend our money on paper before we spend it for real. Uh, so that as Dave Ramsey says, uh, we tell it where to go instead of wondering where it went. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, approach my, I approach my time uh, the same way. And I don't mean just with appointments and meetings, but when a week begins, I've mapped out an ideal week. Like if this week were to just go swimmingly, what would that look like? Now, do I realize the ideal most weeks? No, but unless you're willing to take time to identify the ideal, you're never going to even get close. And so that means, you know, blocking out my time, identifying the big rocks, making sure there's, I have a date day in the middle of my week, uh, in the middle of my day, even 11 to three every Wednesday, where my wife and I take some time together because we like date days better than, you know, going out on a Friday night and it's all busy and peopley and all that, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I've identified the big rocks. I've identified, okay, what day is best for me to work on my podcast? And what day is best for me to do an interview? Um, and I have specific days where I do just those things. I do interviews almost exclusively on Fridays. And I, and I you know, try to work four to eight weeks ahead. So I, at any given time, I know what my next six or seven or eight interviews are going to be. They're already on the schedule, Right. And so uh, those types of, of exercises, understanding how you want your week to go ideally, and then on paper, putting that down. Uh, and that includes, and going back to the topic of reading, I schedule my reading time. That's how I read a book a week. That's how I read 52 books a year, is I set aside time to read and I protect that just like I would any other appointment with anybody else. And if somebody says, hey, Jeff, do you have time on Thursday to do this? I look at, oh, I've got an appointment with myself to read. I can say, no, I've got an appointment at that time, but will this time work better? I treat the appointments with myself just like I treat my appointments with anybody else. And so that time's protected. It's on my calendar. Clients who are looking to book time with me won't even see that time as available because I've got it set aside to read or whatever the thing is. And, and that uh, thinking, that way of approaching the week to me has been huge for my, for my productivity and, and now being, um, I can't say this for all eight years, but for the last almost four years of my podcast, I've never missed a Tuesday publishing an episode. So that's mainly because I started instituting that idea of an ideal week and mapping out my week on paper first before actually, you know, you know getting to the end of the week and wondering where it all went. <laughs> <laughs> Love that, Jeff. Uh, final question before we get into the win the day rocket round. On your best day, what's something that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on a worst on your worst day? Oh, <laughs> you are a writer. <laughs> uh, yeah, for for so long, um, I've uh, I've wanted to write a book. Um, I just didn't think that I had it in me. Um, and uh, it's never too late uh, to, to do something like that. Um, I'm in my mid fifties. I mean, I know I look much younger than that, but I'm in my mid fifties. Uh, but you know, I was just sharing online the other day and, and to my, uh, my email subscribers, um, I had a chance to share, uh, an advanced, re uh, review copy of my book with my family, uh, visited my mom and other family last week. Uh, but there was one person that wasn't there and that was my dad. He passed away three and a half years ago. And I've been wanting to write a book for a long time. And as excited as I was for my mom to see it and see the pride in her face, I missed the opportunity to experience those things with my father. Now, I'm still looking forward to this journey with my family and my wife and my nieces and nephews and all of that, and my friends and my colleagues. Uh, but if you're in a situation um, where your family's still around, the people you care about is still there, don't put off the thing you really want to do, that dream, until someone you want to experience it with is no longer around. 
you know, uh, take advantage of it right now. So that when you realize that dream, everybody you want to be there or experience it with you is actually there. Yeah, you know, I think that's really powerful, especially with what's happened with COVID, where I know it's certainly in Australia, it's a mandatory two week hotel quarantine. So it's very, very unrealistic for anyone like my family to be able to go back to see everyone. So I think that's mm-hmm. helped put things into perspective. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. Where we ask you 10 questions for some fairly quick answers. You ready for this one, Jeff? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Num- number one, what quote inspires you the most? Oh, uh, this one from, and we've mentioned his name several times, Seth Godin. We don't take action because we believe. We believe because we take action. And then he punctuated that with do first, believe second. Boom. Love it. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee, usually two cups. I cannot function as sad as that sounds without my morning coffee. <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Oh, read. Stop messing around and just you know, living for pleasure and, and actually learn something. You, you'll thank yourself later. <laughs> Number four, what book do you gift the most? That would probably be... 48 Days to the Work You, uh, the Work and Life You Love by my New York Times bestselling author, Dan Miller. Number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Ooh, um, vulnerability that I hid within that once became my superpower. Um, uh, pass. <laughs> I can't think of anything. <laughs> Come back to that one. <laughs> that was good. I finally got a question to, to put you off from all your, all your years of broadcasting experience. <laughs> I've drawn a blank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Uh, it isn't really failure. Uh, it, you just learned how not to do something, right? I, I, I think fail, you can't have success without failure. That's what I've learned about failure. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Billy Joel. <laughs> I want to know where he found the inspiration for all these story songs he wrote over these. Just a great storyteller. Uh, and fascinating sorry he's one of those few now that can do it all he can play he can sing he can write loads of respect for that guy piano man one of my top five Mm. all-time favorites fantastic Ah, yeah (laughs) number eight what tool or resource best helps you run your life or business Mm. Uh, i would say probably adobe audition (laughs) <laughs> it's it's a skill or a, 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 an app that I learned to use in my radio days, producing promos and radio commercials. Had no idea how well that was going to serve me in, in podcasting. I use that tool just about every day. Number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Ooh. Uh, well, I was going to say to write a book, but I, I, I guess I can check. Technically, it's not out yet, but, <laughs> but I've written it. So let, that counts. Let's, that let's, counts. Let's, yeah, that'll, that'll be the one. Yeah, we'll do it with that one. And number 10, final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? Uh, it's that morning time. It's making sure that I fill my own tank. Uh, I don't think you can win the day every day unless you take time uh, for that. It's like the flight attendant says, put your own mask on, you know, before you worry about somebody else's. That's what the morning time is all about. And I think if you fill your own tank first and make sure you're doing the things you need to do to, to, to do that, uh, then the rest of your day uh, will go uh, much more productively. Great advice. Well, there are a bunch of ways you can connect with Jeff. I'm linked to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at the Jeff Brown. Check out his Read to Lead podcast and grab a copy of his new book, Read to Lead on Amazon. I can't recommend that highly enough. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jeff. If you can develop the habit of reading and implement the other lessons Jeff shared on the relationship side, you'll be astounded at how quickly your entire life changes. If a friend or loved one needs some help to win the day, share this episode with them right now. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe or follow button and leave a comment with your most valuable takeaway. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you want to submit questions of your own to the guests who come on the show, join the Win the Day Facebook group. You'll find a link to that in the show notes. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Always.